I wrote the song Blackbird in the summer of 94. I worked at a golf course during the day as a landscaper and smoked weed and drank beer with my brother and his friends, who had just graduated from high school, in the evenings. My hours were such that I was exhausted by 8 p.m. I had to be at the golf course before dawn. I rode a motorcycle to work, and the rushing wind was cold enough before dawn that I'd need several layers to keep me warm, even in the summer. It was an early job. The upside was that I got off work at 2 or 3 o'clock, so the night started early as well. The bonfires were still raging when I clocked out for the night. The walks through the woods to the river were over before dinner. I'd come home, baked and buzzed, flip my black light on, and Nick Cave and Mazzy Star would sing me to sleep. My girlfriend was in the next county, a short pleasant drive along the river, but not close enough to see every day. It was a good thing on every level. I had my job, and my freedom, and my time. There was always the landline, the phone attached to the wall, if we felt like talking. But it was good not to see her. Looking back, I wish I'd seen her less. Her parents didn't like me anyway. We didn't have the Beatles in the blue-collar Midwestern town I grew up in, so when I wrote Blackbird, I wasn't thinking about the Beatles song. The original version of my Blackbird had a more complicated chord in the chorus somewhere. It was more beautiful and subtle than the version that finally broke through the mud more than 20 years later. Was it always a duet? I don't remember. Probably. But the only thing that survived from the original version is the chorus, which was simplified due to my inability to remember the nuance in the chords. The lyrics in the chorus are the same, and the intro, but I updated all the verses in 2007. I was living in Austin, and rewrote the song so I could sing it as a duet with a chick I liked at the time, a gothic death rocker everyone in the Red River District was in love with. But it didn't go anywhere. The song had to wait until 2015, when I formed the Arizona chapter of the Wild Boars. The Wild Boars is my band, which I run like a motorcycle gang. Since I'm old, and most of my band members are old, nobody can travel out of their local area to play shows with me. Everybody has kids and domestic obligations. So I have different chapters of the band in different areas, different rhythm sections around the country I travel to. There's the SoCal chapter, the Bay Area Reno chapter, the Colorado chapter, etc., all with rotating members. It worked while it lasted, but the Arizona chapter was home base, and this chick was in it. That's a whole nother never-ending dead-end story. You can read some of the morbid highlights of it in La Katrina Strikes Again or Los Angeles to Leadville. It was a harrowing thrill, an exquisite waste of time. The picture above, depicting a pink-haired desert mermaid on the rock, staring up at the figure of consternation that was me, backlit by the unflinching righteous sun, says it all. Hey, you want a party? Not really. What if me and my boyfriend join your band? Then we can all get entangled, you know, drama and or problems, maybe even play some shows. She turned out to be brilliant. Her boyfriend was a great musician and she was exactly the person Blackbird was waiting for. The lyric sheet was so old when I finally broke it out, it was moldy. It had been sitting in my song folder since voodoo vampires stole the absinthe trade from the French in Old New Orleans. But it worked. The song had been waiting for her. She was an infant when it was written, literally, and here we were, killing it on stage like a couple serial badasses. Mickey and Mallory, or Bonnie and Clyde, or Sid Artha and Nancy. Even though I'm not a Buddhist, though I am an avid Herman Hess fan. We'd all lay on her and her boyfriend's huge bed and watch the mighty boosh, which was weird, and pick up piss-stained roly butts from the enclosed yard where the pit bulls slept. It was a season of mad bong rips, and piss-stained roly butts, and the mighty boosh. And sometimes even music. The pit bull was a sweetie. Impossible to control, like a smiling tornado caged inside a dog, but super sweet. Last I heard, she was living in Jerome, still performing as a solo act. The chick, not the pit bull. She reached out to me as a friend and sent me some outlaw weed via USPS when I was a cab driver in Salida, Colorado, but I wasn't into it. Would have been, but you gotta lose the prosthetic doofus. New boyfriends are a deal breaker for life, as they should be. I'm not cool with it. Nobody is, and they're worthless if they are.
Scuba power was the name of the weed we smoked while hiking in the gulch with Bomber. It was a good day. The infinite beginning of the never-ending end. The wind is so, what about Blackbird? Does the imagination truly betray the mind by sabotaging it into becoming a heart? I'm inclined to think so. It certainly has been my experience. Do I miss the casinos, the flashing lights of Vegas, putting pomade on my hair in the bathroom of the show with no way to wash it out for days? Will I turn into a mic stand of salt if I keep my eyes fixed any longer on the headlights glaring at me through the rearview mirror? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but no. Been there, done it. The songs have all been written. Tell me love isn't wasted. Lie to me again. It amuses me to hear it. But while we're off the topic, nowhere near the reasons for this article, let's take another exit on a highway made of exits into the animated film made by Salvador Dali and Walt Disney in 1945. Even if it wasn't finished until 2003, it makes a heck of a music video. Thanks for listening. The imagination betrays the mind by sabotaging it into becoming a heart. Does that make us dangerous? Does it make us something we are? Darling, you are beautiful, the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. How could I? I can't take any more of your half-assed procrastination. 
station Long your way out the door to the receiver To a more appropriate radio station, yeah